What's up, guys? Welcome to another. This week we'll talk about machine learning fundamentals. So, an outline of today's content. Um, the first thing is information theory. We have spent quite some time talking about the mathematical foundations of modern machine learning. Now we have discussed uh, linear algebra. We have talked about probability theory. Um, today we're going to just spend a, a little time, talk about the last piece of uh, mathematics uh, that we will cover in the entirety of the course, right? So I understand like many of you, you know, find this maybe uh, a little difficult or maybe a little boring, uh, but if you, if you uh, would bear with me, this is really the last bit of mathematics that we will talk about. Um, and uh, after information theory, we will, begin to talk about machine learning, where we'll talk about the type of tasks in machine learning, uh, the general formulation, and we will introduce three uh, very uh, simple uh, techniques, uh, including linear regression, rigid regression, and logistic regression, right? So uh, the first two techniques are about really regression, but the last one is kind of a misnomer uh, which is really, uh, it's called logistic regression, but it's really a classification technique. Now, um, these techniques are very simple um, compared to modern deep learning, right? So um, the, the models are simple. Um, the way to find the solution is simple, but um, I think these things uh, illustrate important principles uh, that we will see over and over again in modern machine learning, right? So that's why uh, we really wanted to uh, make sure that you have a good understanding of the simple things and based on which we will be able to progress to much more sophisticated and advanced deep learning uh, techniques. Okay, so uh, without further ado, we'll start with information theory, uh, which is kind of a theory uh, of the quantization, storage, and communication of digital information, right? So. Um, it is a uh, rich area, and uh, it's, it can answer a number of questions, um, out of which two prominent questions are, uh, number one, how can we communicate through an information channel that sometimes have some noise, right? Say if you wanted to send um, some electronic, uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, some radio waves, right, to uh, another uh, desk from a source place to a destination. And as we know, there are interference uh, in the radio frequencies, right? So what's, what you send from one end may not be perfectly received at the other end. Um, and then you have to be able to find a way to sort of uh, overcome that so that you, you can know uh, what is being said, what is being transmitted uh, in a relatively accurate manner, right? So the second question is, how can we encode information into binary form? Right, so um, we, we we could transmit things in analog forms. I think um, before the invention of digital computers, um, a lot of radio waves and radio encoding is done in a analog form. Um, but since we have these days uh, digital computers, uh, we want to make sure the information is encoded efficiently so that uh, we transmit a small number of bits so that we save bandwidth if we're talking about communication, if we're talking about storage, right, we have limited amount of hard drives uh, and memory. So if we can encode them efficiently, uh, we will be able to save uh, memory space, right? So these are the questions that information theory is concerned with. Uh, we're only gonna talk about a small uh, portion, a very small portion, a few basic concepts uh, in information theory. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is called entropy. Right, so entropy is, um, there is a mathematical definition, but I always wanted to give you a little bit of intuitive understanding, right? So I think that's important. Um, it's important to have both levels of understanding and one is uh, mathematical. You, you can write down the mathematical equations and the other one is intuition, right? So you can see how the mathematical form relate to uh, what is that thing, what, what that thing actually does. Right. And lastly, you need to be able to program it. Right. So there is also kind of implementation level understanding. 
So uh, I think these three levels of understanding is uh, are are very important if you wanted to become a machine learning expert, where you apply uh, mathematical uh, theories to solve real world problems. Now uh, we uh, we look we we'll first look at entropy, and intuitively entropy is a notion of uncertainty. Okay, or can be on also understood as um, the, the amount of chaos uh, in the system. So if the entropy is high, then we have a lot of uh, chaos. We have a high level of uncertainty, and there is very little that we can predict. There's no structure that we can see. Okay, um, so so these things are kind of similar. Um, and surprise and information are similar in the sense that if a surprise thing happened, if a surprising thing happened, and um, for example, uh, a few years ago, perhaps we had uh, a Japanese prime minister uh, who was assassinated, right? So um, that was a very surprising event. Um, if you look at world history, perhaps the last time uh, a major world leader was assassinated um, goes back to the time of the First World War, right? So that has been, I don't know, more than 100 years or something. Um, so, uh, so, that is the reason, though, it is a surprising event is that because we have some normal expectations, you know, we have some world, we have some model of the world and how the world works. And um, the model would say, you know, given how uh, well protected these leaders are, it's, it's very difficult to imagine that anyone could be assassinated like that, right? So if that's the case, if if our world model makes a prediction that contradicts reality, that contradicts our actual observation, then we would say, okay, maybe our model of the world is wrong, right? So that surprising event gives us a lot of information that we should learn from, that we should use to modify our world model, right? So in that sense, surprise and information are kind of really similar, right? Uh, and those are properties of an event, right? So entropy of an event is how surprising it is or how much information it provides. Now, uh, let's dive into the mathematics, right? So uh, entropy is the expectation of negative log probability. So if you have, that should be, sorry, that should be Px here. Um, if you have a uh, random variable x and the entropy of these uh, random variable, which is a dependent on its distribution, is the expectation of the negative log likely log of uh, the, the probability, right? So if you uh, use a uh, continuous variable, we would have the PDF, the probability density function. Um, the negative log probability, right? So this is really finding the expectation of the negative logarithm of the probability under the distribution Px. Right. For discrete variables, uh, things are very similar. You just replace uh, the integral sign with a summation sign, and you replace the PDF with the PMF, right? probability mass function, and uh, there you have it. Right. So uh, we look at some examples. Um, so the first example is about a die that is fair, so that uh, the probability for each of the six sides is the same. It's uh, one over six. And to compute this probability, we just use uh, the equation here. So we have, you know, uh, the probability that x takes on side one, for example, is one over six. And we get the log, the logarithm of one over six. And we have the negative sign, right? So and so this is uh, the the term for x taking on one of the six sides. And we have six sides in total. So we have to multiply by six. And that gives you the entropy. Uh, if you punch things into the computer, uh, it's going to say it's 0 0.78. Okay, so that's a fair die, and we can look at a biased die uh, where the probability of not of the six sides are not equal. So uh, four of the sides have the same probability, uh, one over twelve, and the other two um, are more likely, right? So this is biased toward uh, these two sides. And um, you can verify that these things add up to one. Um, so uh, if we want to compute the entropy of this particular die, and we would do you know 12, 1 over 12 times logarithm, uh, 1 over 12, don't forget the negative sign, 
Um, and then we multiply by four because there are six, there are four sides that have uh, these things, right? And then we have two more sides that have negative one third times log one third. All right. So, and if you punch in the numbers, you will realize that this is um, actually 0 0.67, right? So if you compare these two numbers, you'll see that the die with uniform distribution has a uh, higher uh, entropy. Um, so the way to understand this uh, intuitively is that uh, if you have a uniform die, it's actually very difficult to predict uh, what side this die will land on if you roll it, right? So that means there's more uncertainty or more chaos, right? And if you have like a not a uniform die that is concentrated, the probability is concentrated on a few sides, then you have an easier job to predict, right? I can say with two thirds probability that you know um, the outcome is going to be uh, one of the last two sides, right? So so I, I have less uncertainty and uh, therefore less chaos and the lower entropy, okay? So so that is uh, a kind of an intuitive understanding. And as I said, I think it's important to have that intuitive grasp. Now, uh, we when we have, uh, when, when the distribution is closer to uniform, basically there will be more uncertainty. Um, and in the particular uh, case of the categorical distribution of rolling a single die, uh, you would have uh, the highest entropy when you have a uniform distribution, all right? So um, we will talk briefly about the, the relation of entropy to event encoding, right? So, uh, and it's related to how you encode information. Um, so uh, if we, let's say we wanted to uh, transmit some text in English, and we know there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. So uh, we wanted to design a binary encoding for these 24, 26 letters, okay? Now, uh, assuming that we have these letters appearing with equal frequency, right? Or equal probability, right? These things are the same. And we uh, can use uh, the minimum amount of bits that we can use, we have to use to encode each letter is really uh, 26 uh, taken logarithm uh, with base two, right? So um, base two is um, um, basically this tells you how many bits uh, you, you need to encode uh, 26 distinct possibilities, right? So this is, I think, from um, computer science that you may have learned uh, during undergrad, right? And uh, this is obviously equivalent to negative log base two, uh, one over 26. And uh, so that's how many bits you need, but obviously you cannot use like half a bit. So you need to round it up, uh, take the ceiling operation, and that gives you five bits. So that means if you want to encode A, we could use five zeros. For encode B, that's number one, right? So A is number zero, B is number one, C is number two in binary, and so on and so forth. So if that's the case, then if we want to encode three letters, obviously we need 15 bits. However, maybe the frequencies of these letters are not really um, the same, right? So we know that, um, for example, the uh, vowels, um, the vowel letters, A, E, I, O, U, they would appear a lot more often than um, some uh, other letters. Um, and there are some letters like Z and X that actually appears very infrequently. Um, in the English language. Um, so uh, we can use that frequency information to improve our encoding. Okay, and, and you can, if you think about it, that really tells you something about the information um, that each of these letters give you. Okay, so um, uh, if let's say, uh, you know, uh, we, have, we have these cases, A, B, C, D right here, and because A appears a lot more often, and B is uh, less often, but not too bad, and C and D appears the least frequently in the data set that we have. Okay, so if that's the case, then I could assign 
um, a short encoding um, for A, maybe 0, 0, 1, uh, a slightly longer encoding to B, and uh, longest encoding for C and D, right? So this is really just a simple example, um, not mean to reflect reality in any way. Uh, but, you know, the idea is that you wanted to use a short encoding for things that are frequent, right? And you want to use a long encoding for things that are infrequent. And on average, if you multiply by their relative, uh, by their respective uh, probability, uh, then you will see, you know, uh, the, the actual expectation will be shorter uh, because we're using frequency information to optimize our encoding. In this case, uh, for the three letter word BAD, uh, we would have, have, you know, the first four letters is B, and this is A, and this is uh, D, right? So we actually use fewer bits, and uh, that's that's a good thing, right? So, uh, so, and on the other hand, um, you could say, you know, what is the number of bits um, what is the theoretical lower bound uh, on the number of bits I need to encode any letter or any event? So a letter could be an event. You know, you observe A as the first letter, so that's one event. You observe B for the second letter, that's another event, right? So uh, we could say that negative log probability, um, we could use uh, base two uh, because, you know, if we want to use binary encoding, um, this is the number of bits um, that you need to communicate that the event has happened. Uh, in other words, this is, quote unquote, the information content of this particular event. And this really uh, makes sense, right? Because we said that we wanted to uh, use a, a small number of, uh, we want to use a small number of bits for frequent events. Therefore, frequent events have less information. And we want to use a long encoding for uh, infrequent event. In that case, uh, the infrequent event has more information, right? So if you um, meet some really rare events, that, that should give you a lot of information. Like, you know, um, an alien UFO have arrived um, on Earth. You know, that should give you a lot of information, right? So, um, and the expectation of that overall because there are many events, and if you do the average, do the expectation over all these events, um, that gives you the entropy. So this is really the entropy equation that we have. Okay, so that's kind of the understanding we want to have um, with respect to a simple concept, uh, entropy. But if you think about it, there's actually quite a bit of stuff in there, right? Uh, so uh, another related and often very frequently used concept in machine learning is known as the cross entropy, right? So uh, for two probability distributions, P and Q, the cross entropy is the following. Um, so we have um, uh, probability, uh, we have two probability distributions, P and Q, and uh, we still have the encoding schema designed for events under uh, distribution P, right? So because remember, this is kind of the least number of bits, um, the theoretical lower bound uh, for the number of bits that you need to transmit uh, in order to describe a particular event, in this case, X, right? So, um, so X happened and you use that number of bits to communicate it. Now, this is an optimal encoding scheme. However, um, that optimality depends on the distribution P. If the real distribution is not P, but Q, then you have to kind of compute the expectation using the Q distribution, right? So we replace what used to be like a P distribution here. Now I want to replace that with Q. Um, so, so that's what we really encounter in the real world, right? Because you know, when you design this schema of encoding, maybe you don't have all the information you need. Uh, maybe you, maybe the world has changed. Uh, so the probability of events have shifted since you designed the schema, and now we need, and now we got something else, right? So, uh, so that's 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 Q. Now, uh, once again, this is asking the question that we have: if we have designed an encoding schema for 
the probability distribution P, but the actual distribution we observe is Q, then how do we, uh, what, what, is the, what is the current number of bits uh, and expectation that we need to encode events coming from Q? So that's uh, kind of an information perspective on the cross entropy. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is known as the Kullback labeler divergence, sometimes also known as the relative entropy. Now, um, the relative entropy is a measure of uh, the relative uh, distance uh, between two distributions. So it is uh, mathematically defined in the following. Um, so we have the expectation, we have the divergence between P and Q. And we have P here. And um, um, we have, uh, within the expectation, we have the logarithm of a ratio on the numerator, we have P, and on the denominator, we have uh, Q. So if you uh, assume discrete distributions, you have something like, you know, P is our P, sorry, P, M, F, probability, mass functions here, and in all the distributions, and, um, you know, it's a sum of uh, discrete terms. Uh, it Alternatively, if these are continuous variables, we would use the probability density function, um, and we would compute the integral. Okay, so that's uh, the definition for the Kullback labeler or the KL divergence. It turns out the KL divergence, as a measure of distance between two distributions, um, has some close relation with the cross entropy. Right, so uh, we will we will try to see what is it uh, here. Right, so this is the definition of cross entropy. This is the expectation. The function being the function in the expectation is log p, and there's a negative sign here. So negative logarithm p um, under the distribution p uh, q. Right, so this is the definition of the cross entropy. Now, if we uh, if we take that and we wanted to uh, do a little uh, transformation. So here I'm going to uh, basically add this one term. And this is, if you look very closely, this is like the negative entropy of the uh, Q distribution, right? So, uh, and if, since we add this term, we have to subtract the same term since that, since uh, we have to keep the equal sign, right? So this term here uh, is the negative log Q uh, then we do the expectation over Q, right? So this is actually the entropy. And uh, this term, it is negation, it's negative entropy. Now we're going to take these two terms, the first and the second two terms, uh, uh, we're gonna merge them uh, because um, if you if you do the thing, right? Because P is, you know, there's a negative sign before the log of P and there's a positive sign before log Q. Uh, if you merge these two things um, within the logarithm becomes Q over P, right? And the expectation here is, is the same, right? So we can take out the common term, which is that. And that, and this, um, that is actually just uh, the KL divergence between Q and P, right? So here we have KL divergence between P and Q. Uh, so you can switch, uh, switch positions and you will see um, that is uh, on the bottom we have the KL between Q and P. And the last term here is really just the cross entropy uh, of Q, uh, the entropy of Q, right? So uh, entropy, entropy of Q. Now, if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, right? So um, the cross entropy, uh, the cross entropy is basically the entropy of the actual distribution, right? So, uh, Remember the entropy of the distribution Q is the least number of bits you need for an optimal encoding scheme um, that encodes uh, events coming from the distribution Q. So no matter what you do, you cannot really do better than this, okay? No matter what kind of encoding scheme you design, this entropy is the lower bound. You cannot do better than this, okay? So uh, if you use a schema designed for distribution P, then you are bound to do worse, right? So you have to do, use more bits. So you have to add something and the KL is always uh, non-negative. Uh, so you have to add something to it. 
Okay, so the 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 cross entropy is gonna be less optimal than the entropy design that in the entropy which uses the schema design for Q itself. And the difference between the cross entropy and the entropy is really how different uh, the distribution P and Q are, right? The more different, then the less optimal the uh, old encoding scheme becomes, right? So that's why uh, we can relate uh, the cross entropy and the entropy and the KL divergence. And isn't that beautiful? Right, that that really uh, to me that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, we wanted to uh, look at some properties of KL divergence, um, uh, which is also an extremely commonly used term in modern machine learning. Um, it is a measure of uh, it, the, it is as a distance measure. It is not quite uh, what you may expect. Uh, for example. Uh, for any distance measure, uh, sometimes referred to as a metric in mathematics, um, for a valid distance measure, we would expect this whole thing to be symmetric. So the distance between X and Y should be intuitively the distance between Y and X. You know, like uh, if you go from home to office, you took me, it took you, um, you know, it was three meters going from, sorry, three kilometers going from your home to your office. It should be three kilometers going from your office to your home. You know, that, that just makes sense. Um, <laughs> but um, a funny thing about KL divergence uh, is that this is not always uh, symmetric. You know, it's actually asymmetric. And uh, you can see, right, it, from the mathematical equation that, you know, Q and P, um, they don't take, like, equal status, you know, one appears on the denominator, one appears on the numerator and outside the logarithm. So there's no Q outside the logarithm. So you can see they're not, you know, equal status. And uh, let's maybe analyze this a little further. So we would say, you know, this uh, P double on Q, we want to say this is the forward KL divergence. And we also have the uh, reverse KL divergence, which we write as Q double on P, okay? So since we have these things, then um, uh, we, first of all, then we'll look at the forward KL. And uh, when when P is a larger value and when Q is smaller, small value, what happens, right? So when P is a large value, but Q is a small value, then uh, a large value divided by a small value will be a large value. Right, and when you take the logarithm, logarithm is a mono monotonic uh, function, so the value is going to be still relatively large. And on the outside, you got multiplied by p, uh, which is large. So uh, all in all, you get a large KL divergence. So when something and something like here, here we have a large p, which is the blue distribution, and we have also the Q distribution, which is green. And here we don't see any green. It's because, uh, you know, the green values are too small. Uh, it's very hard to see. Um, so the P values is large and the Q value is small. So in these areas, we would actually have a pretty large KL divergence. The, if you use this as a distance measurement between these things, you say, oh, those things are, those two distributions are actually very different. Okay. Um, and it, it is, they are indeed quite different in the sense that Q has, you know, one mode. Um, uh, a mode is like local maximum. Um, and uh, P has two modes, right? So two local maxima. Um, so uh, we also have a bottom scenario, this scenario here. Uh, you know, we will see, okay, the, the green distribution and the blue distribution are still quite different. Right. However, um, if you look at you know the the area in the red circle, we have a pretty large Q value, but a small P value, and that turns out to give you a small KL divergence. Okay, and that's because uh, when this value on the numerator is small, and the value on the denominator is large, and you would say, you know, this is going to be a small value. And after taking logarithm, it's still a small value. But when you multiply uh, with P on the outside, it's still going to be 
a pretty small value, right? Because P is a small value. Okay, so this in this area in the red circle, we are actually going to have a small divergence, even though you can see intuitively on the picture that these two distributions are actually pretty different, you know, but the KL fails to catch that. Okay, and if you look at the reverse KL, it's kind of the opposite. Um, if you here, if you if you put Q in the numerator and P in the denominator, you would have the exact opposite because this value we would have a large Q and small P, and that's going to give you a large KL divergence. Okay, so so that's a way to see that the KL divergence is asymmetric, um, and it doesn't quite satisfy the intuitive uh, uh, requirements that we typically have uh, for a distance measure. You know, it doesn't satisfy um, the kind of axiom that says uh, dx uh, y should be the same as dy x. Uh, so they're actually not the same. And it's kind of a little counterintuitive if you uh, if you think about it, right? So what what can we do? You know, um, a thing that we can do is known as the Jensen-Shannon divergence. It's kind of a slight modification of the um of the uh uh KL divergence. Um so we first would compute a average of uh P and Q. So P and Q uh we take their average that's known as the distribution M and we would do uh one half KL P over M and one half KL Q over M. Um so and you can easily verify that this is a uh, symmetric distribution, right? So um, a symmetric measure like d uh, x y will be indeed equal to d y x. Okay, so that basically uh, concludes our discussion on information theory, and we will take a short break. And after we come back, we'll talk about uh, some machine learning basics. <laughs>